Hi, Craig. Hi, Craig. Hi, Craig. Hi, Craig. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the paddock. Today, we're going to be doing a lesson on Red Bull, from who they are as a business to their history on the formula track, and everything that's made them a household name. We're really excited to dive in on this, and it's no secret that Red Bull has had an amazing run. So we have a group of girls here that are ready to tell you about it. On the episode, we have myself, Chelsea, we have Hannah, Drea, and we have Amy. And we're going to start off with Drea and a little Red Bull background. Yes. Before we get into how Red Bull became the iconic racing team there today, let's start with how Red Bull got its wings. So as many know, Red Bull is most known for its energy drink and marketed as an adrenaline rush. The company first came to be in 1984 by the owner Dietrich, who was influenced by functional drinks from East Asia to create something new and fun. Three years later, after many efforts to get the perfect formula, Red Bull Energy Drink was launched on April 1st, 1987 in Austria. If people in Austria celebrate April Fools like we do, imagine Dietrich telling everyone about his drink and them thinking it was a joke for the day. Well, joke would be on them because in 36 years, the company has accomplished many things other than creating a whole new product category. Now the question is, how did Red Bull, an energy drink company, become such a big player in sports? Energy drinks lead to adrenaline. And when do people have the most adrenaline, you might ask? Well, when they're doing some wild things to break records and defeat the odds. The company started flirting with the idea of sports sponsorships in the 1990s. First with extreme sports such as BMXing, skiing, flying, and skateboarding. They held their first Red Bull event in 1989, the Red Bull Dolomitan Man. After downhill skier Warner Grisman had a dream about the ultimate extreme relay, where athletes compete in teams to run up a mountain, fly through the air, battle uphill on two wheels, and brave the rapids on water. From there, the first motorsport-sponsored athlete was Gerard Berger in 1989, who was at Ferrari that season. The company did not sign their first international sports stars till 1994, which were Robbie Nash and Bjorn Dunkerbeck, who were windsurfers. Nash was from the U.S., whoop whoop, hello fellow American, and Dunkerbeck was from Denmark. The following year in 1995, Red Bull became title sponsors with Team Sauber. This is where we start seeing Red Bull logos on the livery of F1 cars. Surprisingly, the new sponsorship that was announced this 2023 season is not so new of the companies working together. Team Sauber used Ferrari engines while Red Bull was the title sponsor back then, and Red Bull has done many things, but one of their best decisions was when they created the Red Bull Junior Team in 2001. Lots of racers have come out of this program and had lots of success, such as Sebastian Vettel and Max Verstappen. Red Bull believed in their athletes and has a whole campus dedicated to not only their sponsored athletes, but any athlete who wants top-notch training at their athletic performance center in Salzburg. Now that we've gone over how the energy drink started its journey into sports and sponsorships, let's talk with Hannah about how they channeled that into having their own stakehold in F1. From Red Bull founder Dietrich desired to disrupt the status quo in F1, the team established itself as a force that played hard off the track and even harder on it. With Christian Horner as the sport's youngest team principal, Red Bull Racing made an immediate impression on the grid. Red Bull Racing came into existence late in 2004 under the guidance of team principal Christian Horner, aka new to F1 as well. He had ambitions to challenge Grand Prix victories and world championship titles. Over the next four seasons, though, the team laid solid foundations for later success. The team recruited in both quantity and quality, steadily expanding in numbers until they were capable of matching the most illustrious names in racing, like Ferrari and Mercedes at the time. Many of those recruitments came with proven championship slash winning pedigree, but the growing team weren't looking solely outwards, but also promoted within. Rebel Racing were a young team in every sense. Rebel agreed to the purchase of Jaguar Racing on November 15, 2004. It is reported that Ford asked bidders for a symbolic dollar in return for a commitment to invest 400 million in the team over three Grand Prix seasons. Since its F1 debut in 2005, Oracle Red Bull's racing's mission can be molded in one single phrase to win 
and to do it differently. When I think about that, that is what they can do to set themselves apart from everyone else and be good at it. And now on to Formula One. Okay. And before we go into their Formula One beginnings, there's just a few little more fun facts from the resident Red Bull girl. For those who don't know, Red Bull does race under the Austrian flag. While they are based in the United Kingdom, they have always raced under the Austrian flag. And they also own technically two teams on the Formula One grid, the other one being Scuderia AlphaTauri, who we will be covering in an upcoming spotlight. So keep an eye out for that. Now, 2005, Red Bull decides to make their entrance to the F1 grid, and they continue to have access to the Cosworth engines that had been previously supplied to the team and had been developed for the 2005 chassis that they were running. The operation continued under the new title of Red Bull with Horner as their team principal and brought in a lineup of former McLaren driver David Coulthard, who you might recognize as a current F1 pundit, and Christian Klein, who was brought in to drive the chassis that was christened as the RB1. Coulthard was brought in because he's got a ton of experience and was considered ideal to lead the new team. The second car was originally supposed to be shared between two young sponsor drivers, Christian Klein, who had previously driven for Jaguar in 2004, and the 2004 F3000 champion, Vittonio Luzzi. Originally, it was announced that they would be swapping duties during the season every four races, but by the end of the season, Luzzi had only appeared in the car four times. During the 2005 season, Red Bull went on to amass more points in the first two races than Jaguar managed to in the entire previous season. They finished sixth in the Constructors' Championships for most of the season. They were actually only beaten out by the Bar Honda team, who really improved towards the tail end of the season, which led to have Red Bull finish as seventh. They overall scored a total of 34 points, 24 of those being for David Coulthard, nine for Klein, and one for Luzzi. Rebel was really consistent in points and it even had some occasional podium challenges during the season, which was fantastic for their debut season. 2006 was a very different year for them. It was much more difficult than their first year because they decided to switch to having a Ferrari power unit. That came as a change due to a rule, which was mandating the use of V8 engines, which made it so that both Red Bull and Ferrari could actually use the same specifications on their engines. Leading into 2006, it was also announced that Red Bull had hired Adrian Newey, who at the time was working for McLaren as their technical director and was brought over to Red Bull by Christian Horner. The RB2 hit the track for the first time and David Coulthard completed a handful of laps in Silverstone. And when he got out of the car, declared that the new car was a, quote, sexy looking thing, end quote. But I do highly suggest you listen to it because it sounds much better coming from David Coulthard. Coulthard actually finished third in Monaco that year and took the team's first podium. During that weekend, Christian Horner had said before the race that if one of the cars finished on the podium, he would jump into a swimming pool at the track naked. While he did end up jumping into the pool, he only went in wearing a red cape, which there are photos on the internet. They're the best things I've ever seen, and I highly recommend you look them up. But that was kind of the start of Red Bull's swimming pool tradition in Monaco. You had Danny Rick going in, Max, Checo. It's just become their thing. During the season, Coulthard was much more consistent than Klein. He was just leaps and bounds ahead of him, and that comes with age and experience. Before the end of the season, it was confirmed that Klein would not be staying with Red Bull for the upcoming 2007 season, at least as a race driver, because they had decided to bring in Mark Webber. Overall, they amassed 18 points less than the previous season in 2005 and did face some challenges from their sister team, who now is called AlphaTauri, but at the time was called Toro Rosso. And the team finished seventh in the Constructors' Championships with 16 points, five points ahead of the struggling Williams team. Coulthard earned 14 points and finished 13th in the driver's standings, and Klein, who Departed mid-season, only scored two points, and was classified as 18th. Klein's replacement, Robert Dornboss, failed to score any points that season. 
Now, in 2007, we saw the debut of an Adrian Newey designed Red Bull car, the RB3, which had David Coulthard and Mark Webber as drivers, which for me is a fantastic driver lineup. So much talent between the, do- the two of them. But after lengthy discussions, over obligations to continue using a Ferrari engine, the team announced that they were actually going to be using customer Red Bull engines for the 2007 season, and that the Ferrari contract was going to be passed over to Toro Rosso. During the 2007 season, Red Bull also became an official Australian constructor and received their Austrian license to race under, but continued to operate in their base in the UK. Red Bull managed to strengthen their technical department by hiring Joff Willis for, as their technical director after the team made that shift. It just really seemed like their luck shifted and they had their record best finish at the European Grand Prix with Mark Webber being third, with that being also his second career podium and David Coulthard finishing in fifth. 2008, we had the same drivers and they raced under cars numbers nine and 10 after finishing fifth in the previous season. Rebel brought in the RB4 and announced that Sebastian Buemi would be their test driver and their reserve driver for the season. At the halfway mark, the team had brought up about 24 points, the same as their total for the 2007 season, and were locked in a fierce battle for fourth. The team had resolved a lot of their reliability issues that had plagued them in the previous year. However, as the season progressed, they really did fail to keep up with their competitors. Red Bull scored just four points in the last 10 races of the season. Toro Rosso, who was at the time dubbed the Red Bull B team, had surpassed their total by the season's end and even won the rainy Italian Grand Prix that happened that year, becoming the first Red Bull-owned team to win a race. This led to claims that the Renault engine was lacking in horsepower compared to the Ferrari and Mercedes engines. And now a few other fun facts. As Drea had mentioned, Red Bull does have a junior team where they sponsor young drivers. Some of their high profile drivers include, as Dre mentioned, Sebastian Vettel, Daniel Ricciardo, Max Verstappen, Pierre Gasly, Carlos Sainz, Christian Klein, Vitantonio Luzzi, and Scott Speed. And their current drivers in Super Formula, it's Liam Lawson. And then in F2, we have Dennis Hauger, Ayuma Iwasawa, Jack Crawford, Isaac Hadjar, Enzo Fittipaldi, and Zane Maloney. And now Chelsea is going to cover everything from 2009 to 2013, which brings us Sebastian Vettel. And in 2009, something new begins, something exciting. And it's not just Sebastian Vettel joining Mark Webber on the team and replacing David. It's actually that this year we're introducing the RB5, and that is a car that got Red Bull and Vettel to the podium many times. Now, I did some research on this. And if we have a tech fan listening, please message me if you have some facts I missed. But Red Bull came in with a complete new car design for the season, introducing something on their website that they called a reworked aerodynamic package designed to improve overtaking. And boy, did it. Let me explain. So the changes to the car were first, we have a higher and narrow wing. This is the rear wing. So it was kind of ugly. I'm not going to lie. But this was apparently a key tool for the Overtaking Working Group, otherwise known as the OWG, and they wanted the cars to make this change. It's supposed to be less turbulent on the wake, and basically it's moving that fast air that blows behind it away from any cars that are racing directly in the back. The second thing was the RB5 didn't have a kinetic energy recovery system, or occurs. And this was something that the other cars on the track did have because F1 was just starting to introduce the hybrid technology, but RB was like, that's too heavy. We're not going to do that. And they chose to just not have curves on their car. Lastly, we're racing on slicks again because it's 2009. And even though the OWG banned it in 1997, they were like, nah, we're going to bring it back. And this was supposed to create a balance between aerodynamic and mechanical grip, which Honestly, that was a winning combo for Red Bull. That season, Vettel scored their first pole and victory as a Red Bull team at the China Grand Prix, and he followed it up with five more wins. So they ended that season finishing runner-up in both championships, and that is with Vettel. Now, 2010 was a little stressful, and this is because we are starting to see some tension between Mark and Sebastian, 
And this really became a super famous feud that some of you listeners might know about if you're like Red Bull fans. Throughout the season, we saw Red Bull consistently leading. They were doing great in the qualities. They were doing great in the races. And Vettel and Weber were like fighting each other for these pole positions and podiums. We also had Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso in the fight. So this was like creating a group that was ridiculously good and exciting to watch. Obviously, the success of both drivers in the season is what was causing some tension. And we did see this explode at the Turkish Grand Prix. And this is when Weber was like ahead on the track and Vettel tried to push past him. But instead, he ended up crashing into him. And this is like on lap 41 out of 58. So Weber lost the lead. This is the video, and some of you guys might know what I'm talking about, and it's like Sebastian's walking away from the car, and he's just rolling his, like, fingers next to his head, and he's like, this dude's crazy, and I'm like, you know what? Valid, amazing meme. Anyways. By the time we got to Abu Dhabi, it's November, the season is almost over, and Christian Horner, team principal, he had just announced that Red Bull is not doing team orders. Like he said, at the end of the day, I am sure they will do whatever is right for the team. These were his words um, when people were asking like how Red Bull is going to handle Weber's possibility of winning the championship. Like, would Vettel move over if it meant his teammate could win? Maybe. You know, he's got to do best for what's the team. But it was wild. It was rough. And in 19 races, the first place winner switched around like 10 times for the championship. So it was musical chairs. And Abu Dhabi, we saw Mark Weber come in eighth place. So he basically ruined his chances for the championship and we saw Vettel like get first. So he secured his championship, which not a great day for Weber. But this win at the time made Vettel the youngest Formula One champion and Red Bull now has the youngest champion, which is technically something they still have. So they're winning. And if you check out Red Bull's website, they do mention that the RV6 might not have won the most races, but this car has like a special place in their heart because it got them that first championship and they just love it. And I think that's so sweet that they have an attachment to this car. <laughs> Next, we have the RB7 in 2011 and it was disgustingly good. Like, gross. This was where we saw Formula One bring in the drag reduction system, you know, DRS to the cars. And according to Red Bull, this is like the easiest definition I've actually seen of DRS. And... When following a driver, if you're within a second of the car, you know, at a defined point on the track, a signal will be sent to the car, allowing the driver to activate an adjustable rear wing. So what that does is a flap in the rear wing will open and it's going to substantially reduce the drag and it's going to allow the driver to like attack and, you know, hopefully potentially pass. The system was a really simple and effective addition to the car and it was so dominant the car, I mean, that honestly, they said they rarely needed it to make passing moves. And that's such like a little dig. I loved it. I do love that Red Bull toots its own horn here, okay? Because they were also made to add the curves this season. Like, you know, in 2009, they opted out of it. Well, psych, they have to do it now. And they're also using Pirelli tires with the new contract that's happening. Now, the RB7, it did help Weber and Vettel claim 18 out of 19 poles. And they did win 12 races, getting them another championship win for Vettel, again, and another Constructors' Championship for the team. So I will say this did come with a little drama here and there. Pirelli and Red Bull, they kind of got into like this little petty argument because Red Bull said their tires were blistering and Pirelli was like, mm, no, that is your crown driver Vettel driving the tires longer than he should. And I was like, excuse me? But anyways, Red Bull got it figured out. And we also saw Red Bull get those one-two finishes they love. And they extended their contract with Renault for another five years. And we watched Sebastian get that one point he needed to secure his second championship title at the Japanese Grand Prix. Which I did rewatch it. And if you knew that he only needed one point, it was like biting your nails. It was amazing. Next we have 2012. 2012, we have the RB8. We still have Weber and Vettel in the cockpits. And the RB8 actually got like a little pushback because they had completed a really good amount of these technical adjustments and they messed with this floorboard. They messed with the exhaust. They changed the nose. And technically back then, like they were pushing boundaries. So these changes, they created an amazing season, but I will mention how it got back to them. Now, Vettel did admit the car lost some speed during the practice races, at least compared to like the season before. 
but he was super excited because he's like, I'm going to compete. I'm going to get the third world championship. He said, you know what they say, third time's a charm. Now, the season was like absolutely top class. We had six world championship drivers on the grid. Okay, we had Schumacher with Mercedes. There was a McLaren duel. So you had Hamilton and Button. Ferrari had Alonso and Raikkonen was with Lotus, which is a team that is no longer here. And Vettel did say a comment to CNN, which I like really loved and I wanted to share. And it goes, it is a new game that we start on the Melbourne grid. Past glory is great to have, but you have to make sure that it reaches into the here and now. And for someone who had just won the last two world championships and absolutely dominated the year prior, I really like how like calm and level-headed he was about that. So of course, it's going to come as no surprise that Red Bull did it again and dominated the 2012 season. So there was some mishaps here and there. Um, Vettel did call the Indian driver in our reign a cucumber in one race. So there was that. Grosjean had a little accident in Monaco. The FIA did call Red Bull out for modifying the car floor for the Canadian Grand Prix because there was like, this issue with the legality. They had a hole on the car floor that was near the front of the rear tire. And according to the FIA, the floor of an F1 car must be like this continuous grid. So there's no degree of freedom in the body or chassis unit and it has to be impervious. So they did get called out on that. They did make the fixes to it and they did adjust the floorboard. Plus to round up that 2012 on the grid, we saw fights with obviously these other six other champions that were out there. We went back to F1 in America with Coda. Seb did get a 20 second time penalty, which moved him down to fifth position in the German Grand Prix. And something that kind of made me tear up, like just a little bit, because that was so cute watching it. And it was Schumacher letting Vettel pass him during the Brazilian Grand Prix, just to place sixth position, even though he only needed seven, to win the championship title for like his third year in a row. And Christian Horner did this interview and he was saying like how nice it was to see and that it kind of gave a feeling of Schumacher passing this baton onto Vettel because he was doing so well in the championships. Now, this did come out with Red Bull in first and Constructors Championship and seven wins, seven podiums. They got 460 points. So this put them 60 points ahead of Ferrari. Now, in 2013, we introduced a few more things to Formula One. We now have DRS zones. So you know how we brought in DRS before and now there's zones where they can only use this. And Pirelli redesigned their tires for 2013, but they didn't really accomplish what they were going for. So bear with me. I did some research on this, but Pirelli had set out to create tires with softer compounds, a more flexible structure, and reinforced shoulders. So technically, this was supposed to help teams achieve a race with a two-stop strategy. However, in like the first six races, we had Weber and Vettel, plus supposedly a couple other teams, complaining that they needed to watch their speed and they were losing pace in the races because the tires were deteriorating or blistering faster than they should. And this caused Pirelli to kind of check out what was going on and they went back to the 2012 tires. So Red Bull won Pirelli zero. Now the Canadian Grand Prix was a success after the changes and Sebastian Vettel ended up finishing on the podium at P1, which of course led him to re-sign with Red Bull in June and extend his contract to 2015. Adrian Newey actually did admit to Autosport News that Pirelli going back to those 2012 tires for that race and, you know, the rest of the 2013 season, it was a really big factor to their win in the championships because they ended up winning that season with 596 points with a ridiculous lead. They were 236 points ahead of Mercedes. And of course, Vettel, again, at first in the championship with 397 points. Again, with a very high margin, 155 points ahead of Fernando Alonso and Ferrari. I will say, the season was really cool. We did see a couple interesting races. There was one where like this Korean fire truck joined the race during the Grand Prix because Weber had crashed and like they just didn't call the safety car in line. So like Vettel said, he's driving and he's like, oh, there's another car on the track. <laughs> and there was just no warning. So that was fun. Also, like the Korean... Fire truck, it didn't get called out or anything. There was no like penalties. It just came and went. I think they did update some of the changes and how they handle safety cars now, but that was interesting. We also had some gossip, a little gossip in the track that Red Bull had like a secret sneak traction control in the car 
because Seb was 30 seconds in the front, which honestly to me just sounds a little familiar to right now. I don't get the big deal. I mean, shout out to Max. Anyways, there was some car failure and of course Vettel's championship winning race in India. Weber, on the other hand, he decided to retire at the end of the season. He signed with Porsche to drive the 24-hour Le Mans, and we are introducing a face we all love, Daniel Ricciardo, which Hannah will talk about more. I just want to say I love Danny. Danny's, Danny's the best. Danny and Seb were only teammates for one season in 2014, but Danny regards Seb as his best teammate that he's ever had, or so he says. Before Danny made his debut at Red Bull in 2014, Seb was their golden boy. He had four world titles under his belt and wanted more, which is what contributed to his departure at Red Bull. It was also stated by many that the only reason Seb won these titles was because he was in the best car at the time, so moving the Ferrari and bringing them back to the front would only prove people wrong and ultimately make the statement untrue. Another reason for his departure, although he will not admit it, is how Danny was outshining and outperforming him in 2014. His success shifted things at Red Bull and it put Seb on his back foot and he had to shift how he drove since the car was unsuited for him and more towards Danny. Danny ended up finishing third in the championship though that year and Seb finished fifth. Now with Sebastian leaving for Ferrari, it was rumored that Ferrari was supposedly offering Sebastian $92 million to join them and to come to Marinello. But supposedly he was up in tears and upset when he had to have a discussion with Christian Horner and told him about his plans to leave. Red Bull had helped Seb with his rise to success in F1 and helped him make him who he was. So it was definitely a tough decision for him to make. Although Sebastian did sign a deal in 2013 to stay at Red Bull until the end of 2015, it is believed that his lowly positions in the 2015 World Championship triggered an exit clause that allowed him to leave, which we have seen in other drivers' situations, even currently. On one hand, it is a team that wanted him and had the cash to provide it. On the other hand, it's a team that no longer needed him. Now, Danny assumed the mantle of Red Bull's main man, if not the undisputed status of the team's number one driver. He was the man that led their charge towards world championship success. He exceeded all expectations that were put onto him, and the team was hopeful that they can give him a dominant car that can compete with the Mercedes in 2015. So in 2015, Daniel Ricciardo returned for a second season with the team. The previous year, the team did announce that Vettel would leave after the 2014 season, and he was ultimately replaced by Danny Cavat in 2015, who had only spent a single season with the Junior Toro Rosso team. And this year, Infinity Red Bull, Infinity was their sponsor, was supposed to have a great season from the progress Reynolds made with the engine in 2014, that in 2015, it would be a close year to the Mercedes duo of Hamilton and Rosberg. However, it quickly became apparent that reliability, power, and drivability were major issues, which ultimately led to their failure. The team scored their best finish in Hungary, where Ricardo and Kavat finished 2-3. and three. Their only other opportunity to win a race occurred in the U.S. Grand Prix, a.k.a. Austin, a.k.a. Coda. However, both of the drivers made some mistakes, allowing both of the Mercedes cars to pass them, and Lewis Hamilton ended up winning the race. Come to the end of the season, it was the first season without a win for Infinity Red Bull since 2008. Red Bull wanted to end its partnership with Reynolds due to lack of progress and confidence expressed by Reynolds and the engine in the car. Red Bull, however, was unable to agree to have another engine. Um, instead of opting to run Reynolds engines for the 2016 season, but ended up rebranding as Tag Cooper. They ended the season in fourth place with 187 points, with Cavat in seventh with 95 points, and Ricardo in eighth in 92 points. So he was still the golden boy in their eyes. The lowest finished position, though, in seven years. 
And 2016 in general was a much stronger season for Red Bull Racing than 2015, especially since Max Verstappen ended up replacing Danny Kavat. This may be because Daniel Ricciardo was pushed much more by Verstappen than he was Kavat. Ricciardo stating he ended up learning so much from Verstappen on driving techniques to improve as a driver. Who would ever guess that? Red Bull would go on to collect podium finishes with Max Verstappen in Austria and Silverstone and Daniel Ricciardo in Monaco, Budapest, and in Singapore. With both Verstappen and Ricardo being on podium in Germany and Malaysia. Ricardo scored his first pole position at the Monaco Grand Prix and ended up leading the early stages of the race, but after a very long pit stop in which the team took nearly 40 seconds to get a set of tires, he lost the race lead to Lewis Hamilton and finished the race in second. If y'all have ever watched that race, Ricardo was notably very upset with that race result. I would be too if I was him. Daniel Ricardo collected his fourth career victory in Malaysia after Lewis Hamilton's engine had a failure. Verstappen had challenged for the victory but was compromised due to an incident at the start between Vettel and Rosberg, leading to Verstappen referring to Vettel as crazy. In the 2017 season, however, Rebel Racing was able to retain their 2016 driver lineup and continued using their new sponsor, Tag Heuer, branded Reynolds Engines. In the first race in Australia, Ricardo ended up retiring on lap 25 in a weekend plagued with problems for him. So he had an unexpected gearbox change due to a crash, which then led to a penalty because you're not able to do that while Verstappen finished in fifth. Verstappen suffered various reliability issues with the car, though, suffering three retirements due to the engine and one due to an electric problem at the Canadian Grand Prix. He was also involved in three first lap collisions that ended in retirement. The man is prone, even to this day, to have accidents. But he still dominates. The team won three races in 2017. Ricardo won in Baku Grand Prix after starting in 10th, while Verstappen won the Malaysian Grand Prix and the Mexican Grand Prix. Verstappen and Ricardo finished second and third at the Japanese Grand Prix. And in the Drivers' Championship, Ricardo finished fifth with 200 points, and Verstappen finished sixth with 168 points. The team finished third in the Constructors' Championship with a total of 368 points that season. And now on to 2018 and bringing you current. Yeah, so this is basically the domination of Max Verstappen because as you've seen, as Hannah mentioned earlier, he kind of decided he's going to take over and he is true to his word. So the 2018 season saw the creation of the RB14 which if y'all have not seen the memes of the lineup of cars, they're all the same. They all look the same. Copy and paste. They have a few changes, but the design pretty much, the coloring and everything looks the same. They might change a few sticker sponsors here and there, but it all looks the same on the outside. The inside sometimes changes. So at the 2018 season, they're using the Renault engine, and it was the last year that the team built the car around Daniel Ricciardo, who was nicknamed the last of the late breakers. The other driver for the team was, of course, Max Verstappen, who will do many things in a bit that we're about to get into. So for this season, though, the team finished third in the Constructors' Championship with 419 points, while the drivers finished in the points for every race completed except for one, there were a lot of DNFs. Ricardo had six DNFs while Verstappen had three. Daniel had two podiums in which he was the winner of the races, which are the Chinese Grand Prix and the Monaco Grand Prix. And Max had 11 podiums in which he also finished first in Austria and Mexico. This is also the first year that Drive Survive came to the grid to follow the sport, so that's a great watch if you want to see more behind-the-scenes stuff. You probably should to explain what's about to happen for the next few years. With such reliability issues from the Renault engine, Red Bull decided, nah, we don't want to partner with y'all anymore, we're going to switch over to Honda for the 2019 season. With that decision and other factors 
kind of like what was happening with Sebastian and Daniel earlier, as Hannah mentioned. Daniel decided, uh, I'm going to follow where the engine goes. And he went over to Renault, leaving that seat open. So replacing him was Pierre Gasly. And a lot of things happened at Red Bull for the 2019 season. So they got the Honda engine and they got Max and Pierre. Lots of changes. So Max growing up, he kind of had first driver, even if they don't want to say it. Pretty much he had it and he knew everything. He knew how to work the engine. He knew how to work the cars. He knew everything to do and even though Pierre grew up in the junior team also and came from Toro Rosso which is now AlphaTauri he was not as familiar so there was a lot of pressure on him to perform the higher ups at the team decided that he needed to develop a little more even though he was actually doing pretty well especially with all the new changes that they had and he got replaced after the Hungarian Grand Prix with Alex Albon who was also at Toro Rosso, I think, at the time. So Alex was now here for the Belgian Grand Prix and the rest of the season. And with that, Alex's first race at Red Bull ended with Max retiring the car and Albon finished fifth. So he did pretty decent to keep up with Max for the rest of it. Like the change, I they probably could have waited a little bit, but Max retired the car once more, but got four podiums while Alex, for the most part, finished in the points, which is always what they want. The team finished third for the season with 417 points, and Max finished third in the World Drivers Championship. A fun fact for the 2019 season is that Red Bull had the fastest pit stop time three times, which is usually around like 2.3 seconds. And just to feel a little more challenged, Red Bull did a zero gravity pit stop. It's pretty interesting. There's a video of it. So for 2020, the COVID season, when all hope was lost and we were all locked inside. I'm just kidding. That's depressing. What really happened was that everyone was super cautious and some races had to be canceled because they couldn't get into the countries and they had to be COVID COVID swabbed. Like, I don't know how many times that whole time, but they had to do it every day. They got a COVID swab. Uh, If you hadn't heard, some people did end up with COVID, couldn't race. And it was honestly a pretty good season. Like the, there were fewer races because they couldn't get into some, but the season did happen. It was just delayed. There was not a hope lost. It was just a joke, guys. The RB16 again looks like every other one. Think of the wording of that, guys, and you know what I'm talking about. Welcome to TikTok. Okay. Had Honda's RA620H power unit and Max and Alex were the season's driver. There was no switching that year, thankfully. RB16 had a lot of changes to make it more competitive, having to do with the nose, side pods, rear suspension, and rear wing. The team had a car retire in six different races, but Max was showing that even engine problems were no match for him. Verstappen had 11 podiums with two wins, and Album had two podiums. Max finished third in the drivers and Alex seventh, while the team finished second behind Mercedes with 319 points. With COVID messing with the season and how everything worked out, the teams in FIA decided that the same car specifications could be used for the next year of 2021 because development times had also been cut down and wind tunnel times and everything. So Red Bull decided to take that time to say, Mercedes, we're after you. Honda announced that it would be leaving after the 2021 season and they wanted to go out with a bang. The team used RB16B, the B is for like a B spec because they were still able to use the same specifications, and a few tweaks were made, but they did use the Honda RA621H power unit that had a compact camshaft layout, a different valve angle, and shorter cylinder bore space, which all comes out to mean that the combustion chamber shape was changed and the smaller engine had a lower center of gravity. The team had Max, who at this point we all agree is the number one driver for the team, and Sergio Checo Perez. The whole quote for this season was, let's get ready to rumble, because that's what Red Bull said to everyone on the grid, and more specifically, that's what Max said to all the other drivers. He did not care this season. So Red Bull was always competing with Mercedes to be the top team and have the best car. 
The season was no different with Christian mentioning multiple times that he didn't know how Max drove their car because it was not the best on the grid. The season was a huge change because it was exciting to the very last second. Literally, the battle between Red Bull and Mercedes was intense and between Max, who was after his first World Drivers Championship, and Lewis Hamilton, who was after his eighth World Drivers Championship, hoping to surpass Michael Schumacher's record. The battle intensified each race between the two and came to crashes a few times taking either their competitor or both of them out. Most of the time, both of them. Max Verstappen won out on the last lap of the last race of the season to get his maiden championship win. Sergio was a good partner to Max because whenever they would call team orders, Sergio would listen and be like, okay, got you. I know what I have to do for the team and finished fourth in the driver's championship. Even though Max won... As a driver, Red Bull came in second, 28 points behind Mercedes. With that coming back from being second, they had the same drivers line up for 2022 season, but the RB18 kicked off the season with a surprising double retirement for the team in Bahrain. After that, there was almost no stopping the Red Bulls. They had a fierce competitor in Ferrari at the start, but were quick to pull away and maintain their lead. For most of the races, Max and Checo were chilling in the front, almost as if they were on a joyride taking the scenic route. Out of 22 races that season, only five of them were not won by Red Bull. The only two races that Red Bull did not podium at at all, like they weren't one, two, or three, were Bahrain and Brazil. Max was announced as the World Drivers' Championship after some confusion because there were rainy conditions and that affects how points are awarded and they were trying to make sure like they were getting points correct. Anyways, through all of that, Max was officially crowned as the driver's championship even though it was only the 12th race of the season at Suzuka for the Japanese Grand Prix. It's also very fun if you want to go back and watch because everyone's running around to the pit wall and to the FIA trying to figure out, like, is this true? And then Max getting crowned had to be the most awkward thing I've ever witnessed because he also didn't understand what was going on. He had to check multiple to- multiple times, like, did I win? They told me I didn't win. And they're like, no, you won. And he's like, but these other people said I didn't. So it was very awkward. And he literally asked, can I go back to the others now? <laughs> like, he did not want to be separated. He won really early in the season but that did not damper his competitive spirit. He raced like he was fighting for the rest of his life on that grid. When they were like, oh, don't worry about fastest lap. Like, we got it, Max. You don't need any more points. He was like, no, I want fastest lap. Like, I'm still going to get it. What is it? And they're like, no, 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 don't worry about it. And he would take matters into his own hands and still get it. So Checo came into third right behind Ferrari driver Charles Leclerc. And that made Red Bull have 759 points for the constructor world championship for the first time since 2013 when mercedes took over red bull was finally it they were front runner best car also keep in mind with 759 points the points have not changed through all of this they've kept the same points through the years they're just adding more races and they're just winning that much so that's a huge success for them Can we also take a moment to praise Adrian Newey because his designs get in Red Bull through it all. I mean, Max also and, you know, the engineers, but the cars, they have to have a good car in order to win. So that brings us to this season, the 2023 season, which is looking great for Red Bull. (laughs) They have the same drivers, so still Checo and Max. And this year they retained... Daniel Ricardo as an added bonus for their reserve driver. So he's doing a lot of like the sim work and anything that they need for like promotions and stuff. It's honestly great to see Max and Daniel together again. We we're sad when he left earlier. So after completing eight rounds out of the 23 races planned this season, Max Verstappen is in the lead with 195 points and Checo is second with 126 points, making Red Bull the front runner. Now, quite literally, they are the front runner. Max or Checo have won each race so far, and they have been far ahead of the competitors. It's now just a game for the midfielders of, like, what's going on there because they're seconds ahead. It is crazy how far ahead they are. So now that we've brought you current on who Red Bull is today, let's talk about the future of Red Bull, of what it could be, and what it's known for. So as you probably saw at the launch of the 2023 Red Bull 
delivery, they announced the Ford sponsorship. What does that mean for the team? So Red Bull has been working on this fun fact, if you didn't know, since 2021, when Honda pulled out of F1 from an engine slash supporting standpoint, Rebel has been working on bringing engine development actually in-house. This is where the team engines for 2026 are being developed and built when F1 will move to a new power unit regulation 2026 that do away with the expensive and complicated MGUH and place a bigger emphasis on energy harvest by the kinetic recovery system, which should be a happy mix between what you see today and a Formula E just being a little bit of a crossover between. But as more research comes out, we'll let you know what that means. The team has gone on a large recruiting spree to get its engine division up and running and struck on a strategic partnership deal with Ford that will see the American manufacturer pitch in the battery technology and embedded staff. Helmut Marco said in an interview and quoted the following below, with Ford, we now have a partner with the battery sector. At the moment, all car manufacturers are very, very big in battery development. We also have Ford's expertise in the turbo sector. That is a very important addition for us. And this know-how addition, we believe, will be very competitive. To date, testing progress is still going well, but with Audi's arrival in Sauber's future engineer partner, the market is getting even more competitive in the future of engines going forward. So we shall see how the grid gets more and more diverse with engine spectrum and how each one sets them apart. I will say that it has been very interesting to watch the development of Ford and Red Bull bringing the engines in-house. I do think that will set them apart because they were having issues with Renault, then they were doing good with Honda, and so just seeing them bring it in-house will either set them apart from everybody else and or break them. So we'll see what the future is. Now, I've got a little bit more of the gossip side of things, I guess, for my little tidbits. Um, There has been some serious speculation recently about the possible retirement of Adrian Newey. While I absolutely think the man is an absolute genius and will forever sing his praises any chance I get, he is also very much so getting to that point in his life where it it may be time. Um, I would hate to see him go, especially as a Red Bull fan, because he really has built some fantastic cars for the team. I'd be really interested to see who they would consider replacing him with. I don't even really know what those options look like. So I'm definitely intrigued to see what happens with Adrian. I'm hoping that we get a contract renewal for him, but we'll see what happens now on a slightly more wish list side of things. I would absolutely love to see everybody's favorite Daniel Ricardo back at Red Bull for real, not just a third driver that's doing test and development and marketing according to formula uno there have been rumors that red bull is going to be evaluating danny in a three-day test this summer um so it is looking like red bull is planning to keep their options open i have heard that checo seat is supposed to be safe but i'm very intrigued to see what's going to happen especially in that testing but as everybody knows i'm a danny girl so i would just die to see him back no but i Definitely wholeheartedly agree with you about being the Danny girl, but I will say there's also been speculations with FIA bringing Adrian Newey as the like engineer across the board for all teams instead of just one because the Red Bull domination, it would give them more of an even playing field, kind of like Indy does with the same engine, but instead of the same engine, same engineer. Well, you won't see Danny on the Red Bull F1 grid, but one thing I'm really excited about is we have Vettel and Danny driving in the Red Bull Formula Nubering event this year. So Vettel is going to be driving his RB7, and that is the car he lovingly named Kinky Kylie. And that's the one he won with in 2011 during the Formula Grand Prix. Now the event is in September. And this will also be the first time we have an F1 car driven around these iconic venues since Michael Schumacher, who drove a Mercedes F1 car about like a decade ago. 
So you won't see Danny on F1, but I got you here. And we're going to go ahead and end this episode with the absolute iconic quote. Red Bull gives you wings. With multiple eyes, by the way. Now, with their recent win in Canada, this is marked as their century win for Red Bull. So, you know what? Congratulations. You guys made it to 100. I, for one, hope for a full Danny Rick return all the way one day. We hope you enjoyed today's episode on Red Bull. I really love learning about all these teams and the deep dive we all did. What's your favorite Red Bull moment? Let us know on our socials. You can find us on Paddock Girls Podcast on everything except Twitter, where they are Paddock Girls Pod. Don't forget to subscribe and follow the podcast wherever you listen. Thank you for joining us in the paddock. See you next time. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. Goodbye, Craig. <laughs>